everyone, and welcome to um, our Optic Studio FAQ webinar. My name is Kristen Norton, and I will be leading the webinar with you today. Um, this is going to be our first installment of the Frequently Asked Questions webinar. And today, we're going to cover some introductory topics. Uh, we get a lot of tough questions uh, here at Technical Support, and they're often caused by selecting the wrong UI mode in the very beginning. So today we're going to talk about each of these modes and when they should be used. So we'll start with talking about when to use sequential mode, and then we'll talk about non-sequential mode, and then we'll briefly cover when physical optics propagation is needed instead. And for each mode, we'll talk about how to define sources in each, uh, because it is very, very different depending on the mode that you select. At the very end, we'll have a Q&A session and you'll be able to ask more questions if I leave anything out. So we have three different simulation or calculation modes within Optic Studio. Um, the first is sequential mode. Um, and this is used for the uh, classical optics design. Uh, then we have non-sequential mode, which is used more for illumination and stray light. And then thirdly, we have physical optics propagation, and this is intended to be used for laser beam propagation. Both sequential mode and non-sequential mode are primarily ray-based calculations, and there is some diffraction theory that's applied on top of that, but that's just near focus. Physical optics propagation, on the other hand, includes more wave-based calculations. The things that you are measuring or optimizing in each of these modes are very, very different. So in sequential mode, we'll talk about optimizing the image quality. So this is looking at aberrations, and ray aberrations, and minimizing the spot size. Uh, we also talk a lot about entrance and exit pupils, as well as uh, the wavefront and uh, diffraction at the image plane. So in non-sequential mode, the rays are launched more like real sources, and we'll talk about this more throughout the webinar. Uh, but because the rays are launched more like real sources, um, it makes it much easier to measure and optimize things like uniformity um, and power, as well as incident and absorbed flux at different objects. We can also look at image contamination. We can measure brightness or optimize for color values and different chromaticity values. And then physical optics propagation allows you to look at uh, the beam size. We can look at different irradiance profiles at different surfaces in our system. We can calculate divergence angles. We can look at that M squared beam quality factor or optimize for fiber coupling efficiency. Uh, here are lists of some common optical systems or components just to help orient you so you can figure out um, and examples of systems that can be designed in these different modes. So in sequential mode, again, talking about that classical optical design, we can design photographic objectives, telephoto lenses, microscopes or microscope objective lenses, telescopes, relay lenses, spectrometers, et cetera, et cetera. In non-sequential mode, we can very easily design complex prisms. We can model sources light pipes, a variety of faceted objects. Uh, we can easily import and modify CAD objects, um, as well as embedded volume objects. And then in physical optics propagation mode, we can model anamorphic beams. We can look at the fiber coupling efficiency. Um, we can model the Gibbs phenomenon, spatial filters, and other complex optics. And then the key features of each of these are that in sequential mode, this is, this is a very computationally fast mode. The rays are traced very systematically, which makes both optimization and tolerancing very, very fast. In non-sequential mode, we can model realistic sources. We can use real uh, measured source data. We can model complex geometries. And very importantly, we can model both ray splitting and scattering. And then in physical optics propagation, you get the full coherent wavefront propagation throughout the system. 
So we're going to start by talking about sequential mode and just start with a very simple example. This is just showing a screenshot of a cook triplet. And all of the files that I open up throughout this webinar will be saved online. And so you can access these all in a zipped file. But in sequential mode, the rays start at the object plane and travel through to the image plane. So surface zero will always be your object plane or your object surface. And then the last surface or the last row in your editor will be the, uh, the image plane. Lenses are also defined one surface at a time. So here you can see that surfaces one and two are used to make up the first lens in that screenshot. So surface one is the lens front and surface two is the lens back. Okay. So I'm going to switch to Optic Studio now and open up this file. Okay, so here you can see the editor, and as I click through the different surfaces in the editor, you'll notice that in this layout view I have here, the currently selected surface highlights. So here surface one is the front of lens one, surface two is the back of the lens, and now surface three defines the front surface of my middle lens, surface four is the back, and then surfaces five and six make up the last lens, with surface seven being the final image plane. Now, in addition to the object plane and the image plane being uh, very special surfaces in the editor, we have one more critical surface uh, that we call the stop surface. Okay. And this is the most limiting aperture in your system. In the example that I just showed you, it's the back face of the middle lens. But this stop surface is what gives us the entrance pupil and the exit pupil. And in sequential mode, the rays are very systematically launched to fill the entrance pupil. This means that the entrance pupil is what defines the full extent of the rays. You'll also notice in this screenshot that there is uh, some margin beyond the stop diameter. One of the very common questions that we get at technical support is, how do I define uh, my source and my source size in sequential mode? And the trick to remember here is that it's not defined by the diameter of your object surface. It's defined instead by two different things. We have our system aperture that I showed in the previous slide. That's our stop surface and that defines the full extent of the rays. And then where the rays come from is defined by our field points. So here in this screenshot, I have the field points labeled as field points one, two, and three. So field point one is my on-axis field point. In sequential mode, as I said before, we're trying to very systematically launch rays and we're not launching all possible rays that come from the source. We're picking a few specific points and looking at just rays from those points. So the idea is that we want to pick points uh, where we can optimize the results uh, from rays which come from those points. So let me go back to Optic Studio. So here we can see that my object is at infinity. So that means that we have collimated rays coming into our system, and those collimated rays are as large as our entrance pupil. This is easier to see if we only display the on-axis field in the layout. Okay. Now, what about finite sources? So like I said, the size of my source is defined by my field points. And with my fields, with the object at infinity, that limits the different kinds of fields that you can select. Going back to Optic Studio here, we can't draw 
the object plane in this layout okay, because it's at infinity. So the first surface that we're seeing here is the front face of this first lens. And in this case, all of my field points are defined by input angles. These are the angles that the rays enter my system. Now to edit the fields, we can go to what we call a field data editor. Here you can see I have three different field points selected. And right now the type is angle. What I'm going to instead do is change my object uh, thickness from being an infinite distance away to being a finite distance away. Let's say it's 100 millimeters. Now on my layout, I can actually display the object plane. And because my object plane's a finite distance away, I also have a semi-diameter, which is essentially the source semi-diameter. I can also change the way these field points are defined. So for example, I can change them from angle to object height. So my furthest field point is going to be up 20 millimeters on my object plane. And looking in the lens data editor, now my semi-diameter of my object or my source size is also 20 millimeters. So in sequential mode, we have a very unique group of analyses. Um, and these, again, are all very specific to sequential mode and the kind of measurements that we can make here. In particular, uh, the aberrations tool set and wavefront tool set only be used or simulated uh, with the sequential rays. And this is because we need that exit pupil calculation in order to calculate uh, the wavefront. So now changing gears, we have non-sequential mode. Okay. So I'm going to open up a sample file that's a fly's eye demonstration system. Okay. But the three key things that distinguish non-sequential mode from sequential mode are that instead of having one object plane, we actually insert in source objects. And this means we can have any number of source objects and they can be in any location. We also can have any number of optical components, which can be located anywhere. So we're no longer defining lenses by a front surface and a back surface. The lenses are defined by a single object. We also can have any number of detector objects. So instead of having a single image plane, we can have multiple planes where we're viewing the rays. Let me open up the sample file and we can step through some of the objects. So looking in the shaded model viewer here, you can see that my rays start here from an object that's a source volume cylinder. They then hit this reflector. They hit another mirror and then pass through two lens lit arrays with an aperture. And then we hit another reflector. And then this is our detection plane. And this is where we could optimize for a uniform irradiance. Let me show you another example of non-sequential mode. And this is simulating a white LED. And I'm opening up this example to show the importance of uh, ray splitting and ray scattering, uh, both of which um, are very difficult or cannot be modeled in sequential mode. So here I have a source file with a CAD part. And then the combination of objects actually allows us to simulate um, a white LED that's created um, with a phosphorescent material. So the way the shaded model is being displayed right now, we're not seeing the effects um, of photoluminescence or the um, phosphorescent material. If I expand these settings, I can turn these on. 
And now you can see all the different rays that get created uh, from that phosphorescent material. So this slide just shows the difference between the result that you would get without splitting and scattering versus with splitting and scattering turned on. With splitting and scattering turned on, you're tracing both refracted and reflected rays, okay, as well as scattered rays, and each um, path's child rays as well. In non-sequential mode, we don't have uh, a system aperture and we don't have field points. Instead, our sources are defined entirely by the source object. We have a variety of built-in objects. So in the previous example, you saw a source volume cylinder. Okay. But here's another example of a built-in object that's a source filament. Okay. But you also can use source files, which can include real measured source data. In non-sequential mode, you'll see a variety of different analyses. These, again, are very different from sequential mode because we no longer have that systematic ray tracing. This is very good because the rays can go anywhere in our system and we can measure um, a realistic illumination pattern. Okay? But it also means that we have other considerations to take, like running ray traces and only viewing the data at specific detectors. Now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about why we have physical optics propagation and the scenarios in which it's valid. So in order to begin that conversation, we need to talk about the difference between rays and Gaussian beams. So the examples I've shown you thus far are showing geometric rays, and geometric rays only travel in a straight line. So this means that a collimated beam so this is one where we simulate, for example, the object at infinity. That collimated beam size will never change because the rays are always traveling in a perfectly straight line. This also means that diverging beams will retain the same divergence everywhere. Gaussian beams, on the other hand, are always diverging or converging. That being said, there are two different scenarios where we can make assumptions and actually use rays to model them instead. So within the Rayleigh range, the beam size is changing very, very slowly. And so we can approximate this with a collimated ray bundle. And then far from the Rayleigh range, the beam size changes linearly with propagation distance, just like a point source. So instead, we can approximate this with rays and using a point source. These assumptions are explained a lot more in uh, two different webinars that we have. Uh, one is called Simulating Lasers, which talks in much more detail about the Rayleigh range. And we also have Laser Applications, which goes into more detail about um, all of the different Gaussian beam properties. But here is a visualization just showing those two different approximations. So on top, you can see what a ray bundle would look like inside of the Rayleigh range, which is here Z sub R. And then second, we, the approximation we can use is a point source, and this is going to be far from the Rayleigh range. So there are a few key scenarios where the ray approximations break down, and now this is when we need to use physical optics propagation. So this is a tool or a mode that is actually used within sequential mode. And again, it needs to be used when the geometrical ray tracing is not sufficient. And we have three examples of this here. The first is when the beam comes to an intermediate focus, especially near optics that truncate the beam. And an example of this would be a pinhole in the middle of your system. The ray-based approximation may show the rays coming to a perfect focus, but due to uh, diffraction effects, we know this isn't possible, and we can't ignore the effect the pinhole will have on the beam. In that case, you would need to use physical optics propagation. Secondly, we also need to use physical optics propagation when diffraction effects far from focus are of interest. The only diffraction algorithms that we can use in sequential mode and non-sequential mode are only valid when you are at focus. And then thirdly, we need to use physical optics propagation when the propagation length is long and the beam is nearly collimated. Again, this is because 
A collimated ray bundle will stay collimated forever, but as soon as we get outside of the Rayleigh range, we'll start to see it diverging more quickly. And all of this content is covered in the other webinar that we have, which is called Simulating Lasers. So physical optics propagation models these three scenarios uh, by using diffraction calculations to propagate a full wavefront through an optical system, and it's surface by surface. So this mode is using the sequential surfaces, which are defined in your lens data editor, but do not confuse this with the sequential rays. The way you have physical optics propagation set up can be completely different from the geometrical rays you see in your sequential system viewers. But the wavefront is modeled with an array of points and each point in that array stores complex amplitude information. So we have information about both the amplitude and the phase. And this array is user definable. Okay, so we can customize the dimension, the sampling, and the aspect ratio to best meet your system needs. And so I will open up an example file just to demonstrate this. So here you can see in my lens data editor, I have a few surfaces. And what's going to happen is that the beam I define in my physical optics propagation settings will see these sequential surfaces, but it will be very different from the geometrical rays. So the source settings for my uh, physical optics propagation analysis are defined in the settings for this analysis. Everything is self-contained inside of this analysis here. So here I'll access the settings by clicking this down button. And then here in the beam definition tab, we can see all the different options for the beam type or source type that we're using. In this example, we're starting with a top hat beam profile but we also could use a Gaussian waist, or there are actually a few different ways we can use to define um, a Gaussian beam based on the divergence angle or the beam size away from the waist and the divergence angle. This beam file is very important because it means that you can also use a custom beam profile and propagate that through your system as well. So again, this slide is just showing how the way you set up a source inside of physical optics propagation, it's all completely self-contained within this analysis and it's in the beam definition tab. But these different beam types, as well as the different analyses which can be used with physical optics propagation, these are all covered in the other laser webinars that you can access on our website. So to wrap this up, I just want to emphasize the information in the second row here, which again talks about choosing a, the mode or analysis based on what you're going to be measuring. So although you can model the same system in different modes, so for example, I could model a laser uh, coming into a lens which comes to a focus, I could model that in all three of these modes, but the mode that I choose depends on what it is I am measuring. So if I wanna look at the M squared beam quality factor, then I need to use physical optics propagation. But if I instead care about the uniformity at a plane or on a different object, then I wanna use non-sequential mode. Or if I care about minimizing specific aberrations, like coma, for example, then I would want to look in sequential mode because it'll be much more efficient there. So that concludes this webinar, and I'd like to thank you for attending. Just to review, we discussed sequential mode, non-sequential mode, and physical optics propagation, which again is within sequential mode. And we talked about when to use each mode and then how you define sources in each mode as well. If you have other questions or comments, you are more than welcome to email us. Uh, you can send technical questions to support at zmax.com. Now, questions can be submitted uh, via the GoToWebinar control pa panel. And if we don't get to all of your questions now, okay, 
you are more than welcome to email us as well. And so questions regarding this webinar should be sent to feedback at zmax.com. So with that, I'll be happy to take your questions.